Hello and welcome to lesson 25 of Additional Maths with Mr Barrow. Today we're going to be looking at the binomial distribution. Before I start talking th you through an example, I want to explain the, the connection between the binomial expansion and the binomial distribution. Hopefully you've watched lessons 23 and 24 in this series where I've explained what the binomial expansion is because that will connect directly to the binomial distribution which is applying that skill of binomial expansion to probability questions. Okay, so let's have a look at the connection. We know already that if I expand a binomial, for example, here I've got a plus b all cubed. I know that that means expanding three brackets, each of them being with a and b in them. And when I multiply them out, I choose one thing from each bracket to multiply. So I can either choose an a from all three brackets, which would give us a times a times a, which is a cubed. Or I could choose two a's and a b. And that could happen in three different ways. I could get the two a's and the b from a times a times b, or the two a's and the b by a times b times a, or the two a's and the b with using the b from the first bracket and the a from the other two. So there are three different ways in which I can get a squared b. So therefore, I have three a squared b's in my expansion. And the same with a b squared. There are three different ways in which I can get a b squared. And then b cubed I can get by choosing the b from each of the brackets, and there is only one way of doing that. Okay. The binomial distribution is based around probability, and it's based around tree diagrams. So this, this tree diagram way of thinking about the expansion of a binomial will be very closely linked to the tree diagram way of, it, of thinking about probability events. In the binomial distribution, it's all about doing an experiment a certain number of times, where every time you do the experiment, you can either succeed or you can fail. So there are only two options, success or failure. And the probability of success remains constant throughout. So here, in my tree diagram, I'm doing the experiment three times. Just like I expanded three brackets over here, I'm going to be expanding, I'm going, I'm going to doing the experiment three times. So each time I have either success or failure. Let's say the success has a probability of P and therefore failure has a probability of one minus P. And I'm gonna call that Q. So if probability of success was 70%, then the probability of failure would be 30%. So the tree diagram would look something like this. So if I wanted to find out the probability of succeeding all three times in all three experiments, I would do the probability of success times the probability of success times the probability of success, which would be P cubed. So the chance of getting three successes is P cubed. The chance of getting two successes is P squared times q, but also thinking about how many different ways I could get p squared q. And there are three different ways in which I can get p squared q. I could get the failure, the single failure of my three attempts in the last experiment, I could get it in the middle experiment, I could get it in the first experiment. So there are three ways of getting p squared q, which is two successes. So the probability of getting two successes is three lots of p squared q. The probability of getting one success is getting one success with a probability of p and two failures with a probability of q each. So that would be p q squared. And again, there are three ways of doing that. So that would be three p q squared. And the probability of no successes means getting all three failures. And there's only one way of doing that. That's failing every single time. And the probability of that would be Q to the power of three. So if we match the two different things, the expansion of the binomial to the power of three and looking at the probabilities of doing three events where each time I can either succeed or fail, hopefully you can see the connection really clearly. So let's actually do a question which involves this process. So 
In binomial distribution questions, you will always be doing a fixed number of experiments. And in each experiment, you will either succeed or fail. So here's an example. I take 10 penalties. The chance I score is 0.65 in any single attempt. So I've got a 65% chance of scoring a penalty on every penalty that I take. This chance cannot change throughout because otherwise my, my probabilities will be affected and therefore I won't be able to calculate it very easily. So I'm going to have to assume that my probability stays at 65%, that I don't get any better, that I don't learn from experience, and that the goalkeeper doesn't get any better. They don't learn from experience. So this probability that I succeed on any single attempt is 65%. So the probability I fail, do not succeed, is 1 minus that, so it's 0.35 or 35%. I want to find the chance that I score exactly 8 times. So think about it. If I take 10 penalties and I score exactly eight times, what has happened? It means I've got eight successes and two failures because I have taken 10 experiments. So if I succeed in eight of them, that means I failed in two of them. And that can happen in lots of different ways. So I could succeed with my first eight attempts and then fail with the next two. That would be 0.65 times 0.65 times 0.65, etc. Eight times in a row, so 0.65 to the power of eight, and then times 0.35 times 0.35. But I can succeed in eight of the different penalties in many different ways. Those two failures could have come in the first two penalties. The two failures could have come anywhere in between. There are lots of different ways. So think back and think about how many different combinations there are of succeeding eight times from 10 events. That's using our old NCR button. It's the same way of getting, choosing the A from 10 brackets of A plus B to the power of 10, getting the A to the power of eight term, there would be 10 choose eight ways of doing that. So here, the probability of getting exactly eight, and we write that as probability X is eight. X is our variable here. X is the number of successes, okay? So we're counting the number of successes. If x is 8, it follows this probability. We know we're going to multiply 0.65 8 times in a row, so it'll be 0.65 to the power of 8. We know we're going to have two failures, so that's 0.35 to the power of 2. And this can happen in 10 choose 8 different ways. So when we do our probability in binomial, we have the number of ways in which the event can happen. We then do the probability to the power of however many times we've got that success, the probability of success to the power of the number of times we had that success. And then we times by probability of failure to the power of however many times we've had that failure. And then we use our calculator and we allow it to do the work for us. And we get for this one to three significant figures, 0.176. So around 18% chance. Okay, So around an 18% chance that I will score eight times from the 10 penalties. Okay, so not, not very likely, but not, not out of the realms of possibility. Now, let's up the difficulty of the problem. What's the probability that I'd score at least eight times, okay? So you're likely to be asked to find the probability of exactly a certain number of successes, and you're also likely to be asked a slightly more difficult one, which is a range of successes. So when it says, what's the chance that you've scored at least eight times, think about what different events will leave you with at least eight successes. For this, that will be the probability that x, which is the number of successes, is greater than or equal to 8. In order to find that, I need to find the probability of the different events which will give us this result happening. The different events which will give us this result is probability x is 8, and then 
the probability that x is 9, and the probability that x is 10. Have a think about why it can't be any further beyond that, why it can't be probably x is 11. That's right, I've only taken 10 penalties, so I can't get beyond 10 successes in the 10 penalties. So, to find each of those, I need to apply the probability calculation I've done for eight times. I've done the first one already, so I'll, I can write that one down. So this one is probably x is eight, which is our answer from the previous one. So 0 0.176 plus, okay? So I'm not gonna write 0 0.176 because that is a rounded answer. I should have written three significant figures after it, okay? So answer to A first plus, probably x is nine is from 10 games, I want to know the number of ways of choosing nine successes. There are 10 choose nine ways of doing that. Multiplied by the probability of success, so that's 0 0.65 to the power of nine, because that's how many successes I had, times the probability of failure here, which is 0 0.35 to the power of however many times I failed. If I want to count nine successes, that means I failed once. So that's the calculation for the probability x is 9. And then I add the calculation for the probability that x is 10. The probability x is 10 means that I succeeded 10 times. There's only one possible way of doing that, that is succeeding in every single penalty. That is just the calculation, 0 0.65 to the power of 10. When you've got a simple one where the number of successes is either 0 or the total number of trials you did, then it's much quicker and easier to do the calculation. You don't need to know the number of ways in which it can happen because it can only happen one way. So we add those three different probability calculations together and we get the answer, which is 0 0.262 to three significant figures. Please check that you can get that answer as well. So that there is the chance of succeeding at least eight times. Okay, I'm gonna give you a question now, which I'd like you to have a go at, and then I'm gonna go through the answer. So it's a very similar question, uses the same skills. This question, you throw seven darts at the bullseye. The chance you hit the bullseye on any single throw is three out of 11. I want you to find the probability that you hit the bullseye exactly twice. And then secondly, the chance that you hit the bullseye no more than twice. So pause the video, have a go at this calculation and see what you get. So for the first one, to get exactly twice, so the, here the probability that x equals two, That'll be from seven trials, choose two successes, multiplied by the probability of success, three elevenths to the power of two, because you succeeded twice. And that means you failed. If there are seven trials and you succeed twice, that means you failed five times. So the probability of failure, which here is eight elevenths to the power of five. And that calculation is to three significant figures, 0.318. So the chance of getting two bullseyes out of seven is 0.318. Part B, the probability of hitting the bullseye no more than twice is basically another, in other words, saying you've hit the bullseye less than or equal to two times. If you didn't get more than two, you could have gotten two or one or zero. And those are the probabilities you need to find. To find the probability of getting less than or equal to two, that's the same as the probability of getting zero plus the probability of getting one success plus the probability of getting two successes. We've got the probability of getting two successes from the first part, part A. So we just need the probability of getting no successes. No successes means failing all seven times. So that's eight elevenths to the power of seven. 
plus, and then the probability of getting one success, the number of ways that you can do that is seven choose one, which is just seven. To get one success, that success could have happened in the first throw, it could have happened in the second throw, etc., all the way to the seventh throw. There are seven different ways of doing that. But the calculation you would do if you weren't sure about that is seven choose one times three elevenths to the power of one because you succeeded once times eight elevenths to the power of six because you failed six times and then plus your answer to part a and the answer to this is 0 0.708 to three significant figures if you manage to get that then that is excellent work okay you're a novice and so it's not easy to get things right especially with complex problems like this first off but well done but you should still go away and practice this before you go away and practice it though i want to just run through the definition of a binomial distribution what it needs to happen in order for it to be a binomial distribution question so for a binomial distribution the following needs to be true so here's the definition Uh, please ignore my technological issues. There we go. Okay, so the binomial distribution. For a probability question to be a binomial distribution problem, it needs to firstly be about an experiment performed a specific number of times. Let's say that that's n times. And when you do the experiment, each time you only have the option of either success or failure. So there are only two options in each experiment. Okay, in each single trial, there is only success or failure as an option. And if the probability of each of these is P for success, and Q for failure, Q being equal to one minus P, so together they add up to one, success and failure. And the probability of those does not change in each trial. So you don't get any better, you don't get any worse from one experiment to another. The probabilities stay the same. Then the number of successes, which we call X, so X is our variable, can be modeled using a binomial distribution. And this is the way we write that. X can be modeled as this strange sort of twiddle. That means it can be modeled by the following distribution, B for binomial, and then in the brackets, N for the number of successes, and P for the probability of success. So that's how it'll be written out. That's how, how it'll be described and that describes the entire thing. That will tell you that you are dealing with a binomial distribution. It'll tell you the number of successes you're dealing with, and it'll tell you the probability of getting any specific success. Then the calculation that you use, if you have a binomial distribution, that helps you get a certain number certain number R of successes uses the following formula. The following formula is this. If you want to find the probability that X is equal to this specific value R, then you do from N trials, choose R successes, and then you multiply that, that's the number of combination of ways of getting R successes from N trials. Then you multiply that by P, which is the probability of success, to the power of R, because you've got R successes. And then you multiply that by Q, the probability of failure, to the power of N take away R. Because if you've got R successes, then you've got N minus R failures. So that there is the the calculation you use for any specific binomial distribution problem. So just to give an example, 
the one which was your turn, I could have just said this rather than stating it all in words. I could have just said that and that would have set up the entire problem. That states that X, the number of successes, takes a binomial distribution where I've taken seven trials and there, there's a three in 11 chance of succeeding on any one trial. And then if I wanted, if I was then asked, find the probability that X is five, I would do from seven brackets, here, seven trials, choose five successes, multiply it by success to the power of five, multiply it by failure to the power of two, because that two is seven take away five. So what you should do now is you should practice this skill until you feel fluent, until you feel like you're getting the accuracy right and you're getting faster and faster at it. So go to the textbook, exercise 11.2. So the second exercise in this textbook in chapter 11 is perfect for this. Okay, so it has some abstract problems where it just talks about X has a certain distribution and it has some real world problems. You need to be able to turn the abstract problems. So if you're given it just in this form into a real world problem. So I always tell a story here. I've got seven trials throwing darts at, at a dartboard and I've got three and 11 chance of success. OK, and if I've got an abstract problem, if I've got a real life problem, I turn it into this simple form just so that I can simplify it when writing it down on the page. So make sure you can go between the abstract and the real very quickly. Okay, off you go and enjoy, and then come back for the next lesson.